in 2011, uh, MIT and uh, Belimo uh, collaborated on some test installations at uh, six air handlers in our Hayden Library, and uh, with the expectation of, of trying to try different strategies for delta T mitigation in the chilled water system. So the, of, of the various strategies that we were able to test to cut to, cut to the bottom line, the one that uh, uh, we suspected would be the most successful and was is if you actually measure delta T and control for delta T, you're going to improve uh, delta T. So uh, all the details uh, to getting there and how they're able to uh, you know, put this in one uh, smart actuator for uh, local implementation and so on will come from uh, my, my friends from Belimo. Uh, um, all right, where do we need to point this? There we go, there we go. So just for uh, a, a little background, we have a central chill water plant at MIT with about 20,000 tons of steam turbine driven chillers and uh, another 13,000 uh, tons of electric chillers, uh, both at the central plant and at a uh, satellite plant. And the, uh, also in this collage of pictures down in the lower left is the Hayden Library itself, which is about 153,000 square feet and, and has, uh, has six air handlers. This uh, extracted from a study that was done by WM Group uh, back in 2008. And uh, it, they identified, uh, they, they, they were helping us with our, our chilled water delta T problem uh, and, and did a study of our plant, our dispatch, our equipment, uh, very specific to us on what, uh, what was the potential savings. So, and you can see that it's a significant one and a half million dollars. But the interesting takeaway from this is that the, uh, it's not just the, uh, chilled water pumps uh, energy, which, it, which in fact is only about a quarter of the, of the whole uh, damage. The rest of it is if you have to bring on extra chillers uh, to satisfy the flow requirements, there's the, the inefficiencies there plus the uh, energy to run the associated cooling towers and so on. So when you're, when you're looking at the impact, uh, there's uh, a 4x uh, multiplier to be considered. And then another, another uh, graph I, I took from that uh, WM Group report uh, just is a, a scatter diagram showing that uh, there's really very little time up in the upper left hand corner there, uh, under 1,000 hours, when we're doing better than uh, 8 degrees delta T. So again, uh, a lot of potential for improvement uh, on our campus to, to help the uh, improved operation of the central plant. So at this point, I'd like to uh, turn over to Dick to uh, talk about our installation. Thank you, Peter. Uh, just to kind of reemphasize what Peter just uh, mentioned, in fact, the Chillwater plant is, has a 12 degree delta T design. And it does operate like two or three days of the year at design condition. But the rest of the year, it's subjected to this, this really abysmal delta T, uh, low delta T condition with a lot of extra energy that, that, that is expended because of that. So what is, what is actually driving that? This is uh, just basically refrigeration Q is equal to MC sub P delta T. It's just uh, energy. But what is, what's key about this is that the delta T and the volumetric flow are inversely <coughs> proportional. Therefore, if your flow increases, you're going to get lower delta T with a constant cooling load. All right? And uh, that's, so that's, that's what you're looking at over here. What causes low delta T? Essentially, you're overflowing the coil. And it's not just at uh, 25% of load or 50%, you're basically continuously overflowing the coil. The main reason for that is that all control valves are oversized. Why are they oversized? Well, when an engineer specifies the cooling load for a building, he has a particular valve coefficient that he specifies for the valve. When the controls contractor buys the valve, there's no valve that has that precise valve coefficient. 
Does he, does he put, a, put in a smaller valve? No, he puts in a bigger valve. So you're, you're basically sunk from the very beginning. All control valves are oversized. Uh, another big reason is improper balancing, non-dynamic balancing. That basically means uh, you're not using pressure independent valves which address that dynamic balancing issue. You may have dirty or foul coils and then the list goes on and on. There's, a, there's another 10 or 15 reasons for low delta T. Okay, just to, uh, I mean, everybody here knows what's going on, why this, why this adversely affects the chilled water plant, but just for purposes of discussion, uh, say for example we have a 400 ton chilled water plant with a, comprised of a two 200 ton chillers running at about 45% load, 100 ton uh, cooling load. Design chiller uh, delta T is 12 degrees, so therefore you should, by virtue of that equation, you should have a 360 gallon per minute demand for, your, for pumps. This is the way the engineer designed it. In fact, when you turn on the plant, you actually have a 15% higher volumetric flow requirement. What that causes is that you, you've exceeded the pump capacity of one chiller. You have to turn on the second chiller because your load has, uh, your, your volumetric requirement has gone to 414 GPM and your delta T has de depressed to 10.4 degrees. That's why you end up, end up running multiple chillers at significantly less capacity. It's this, this low delta T volumetric flow requirement. At the, uh, going back to the uh, load uh, history for MIT, even at the lowest loads, they're running three or four chillers just to take care of the volumetric flow. Any one of those chillers could take the capacity if it were running at the proper delta T. Okay, so you're running additional pump and a chiller starting to meet the flow and demand, not the cooling demand. And again, it's not just the pump. You have to run the condenser pump. You have to run the, uh, the uh, cooling tower fan. And the, the energy just, just starts getting very expensive. So here it is. You've increased the flow by 15%. The delta T is lowered by 13%. All right, so here's the Hayden Library. Again, it's uh, 153,000 square feet. Six air handling units ranging from five inch chilled water valves down to three inch valves. Uh, we, it was reported that it had a uh, six degree delta T. There was over pumping and it was causing low delta T syndrome at the, at the chilled water plant. For the purpose of this case study, we replaced all six of the air handlers with uh, what we're calling the, uh, the energy valve. And that involved putting uh, two RTD temperature sensors, one in the return line and one in the, in the temperature well in the supply line to the, to the uh, chill water coil. And then we put an ethernet drop so we could get uh, data off the, uh, off the valve and it was being driven or controlled by the analog input coming from a carrier DDC control system. All right, so what's an energy valve? It's, uh, it's comprised of these components. It's a conventional equal percentage characterized ball valve. And like I said, they ranged from five inches down to three inches for this, for this project. Uh, in addition, it has two RD te RDT temperature sensors, one that's actually sunk into the body of the valve, monitoring and measuring the return chill water temperature. And then the second RTD is remotely installed into the supply line going to the uh, going to the coil. In addition, it has a magnetic flow sensor, and then it has an actuator, but it's an actuator that not only uh, modulates the ball position depending on the uh, signal, but the actuator also has a microprocessor. microprocessor. It has a, a data acquisition system that uh, actually records and keeps 13 months of data. Uh, it also calculates the not, it doesn't just measure uh, T supply, T return, it calculates the temperature difference, so we have delta T, and then it actually does the uh, mass flow specific heat delta T, it actually calculates the energy transferred over a 30 second time period, all right? So, 
With this type of a uh, valve, you can then characterize the power curve for a heat exchanger. So for a 24-hour period, if you record that energy, uh, the MC sub P delta T that comes off this valve, you can actually see what the energy curve, the power curve is for a coil, all right? And uh, first time I saw this, I said, that's, that's not what I'm expecting to see. It's significantly nonlinear, but not only that, the energy coming off the coil flatlines and even turns down as the, as the flow is increasing. Okay, at the same time that the, that the, uh, the energy valve is recording energy and characterizing the energy uh, profile of the, of the uh, coil, it's also measuring and storing the delta T over the, uh, as, you, as you're increasing flow. If you put these together, you have a situation where you can see the coil delta T deteriorating, but it's deteriorating as the coil has maxed out. And we were, you know, kind of struggling. How do you, how do you actually describe that, and we had to come up with some new terminology. So we came up with power saturation point, the point beyond which a coil cannot yield additional heat transfer regardless of increased flow. In other words, you cannot get any more cooling effect into your airstream. Doesn't matter how much more water you're putting through the coil, you're flatlining. If you operate the coil beyond the power saturation point, you're in the uh, waste zone, which is operation beyond the power, power saturation point. So looking at the coil, we can say that for this, for this particular coil, air handler number six, we really want to limit the delta T to 12 degrees. We really, there's no point in allowing the flow to exceed uh, a point to which the temperature difference uh, is, is allowed to go below 12 degrees because that's the maximum power that you can get out of the coil. Uh, the, the actuator also has a delta T manager controller that, that, sit, that resides underneath the existing DDC control. And that actually prevents the valve from opening any further irrespective of what the DDC control is, is actually uh, calling for. And uh, what that looks like is uh, this, this trace right here. This is, this is trending of the gallons per minute as a function of time through the, through the valve. The DDC control signal from both the carrier DDC control and the delta T manager control. Here's the actual delta T that, the, that is experiencing across the coil. And then th this just tells you when you're actually doing delta T limiting. Uh, you're, you're actually overriding the DDC control to prevent the uh, temperature from degrading. So on morning startup, you're, you're about to 15, 16 degrees. The chill water curl gets a, gets a command to open up. The delta T, as you would expect, uh, deteriorates. The set point is 12 degrees with a negative 2 degree dead band. In other words, it wants to modulate around 12 degrees, but if in fact the DDC control allows it to go below 10 degrees, then we invoke the delta T limiting controller that resides on the actuator. And that's what happens uh, right at this point. When it goes below 10 degrees, the delta T limiting controller takes over, it, it re recovers the delta T, once it achieves 12 degrees, it hands control back to the DDC to control. Again, the, the uh, DDC control opens the valve, and sure enough, delta T deteriorates. Once it crosses 10 degrees, again, the delta T limiter control takes over, and it actually uh, hovers around very closely to uh, 12 degrees, and it basically takes over control for the rest of the afternoon. It prevents the DDC control from allowing the coil to go into that waste zone uh, part of oper operation. Okay, what does that mean from a pumping energy standpoint? If you look at two points, 
Uh, here's 12 and a half degrees, 43 GPM. If you operated at 10 degrees, 56 GPM, that's a 24% increase in flow with a 56% increase in pumping energy. But remember what Peter was saying about the real impact. It can be as much as a four-time multiplier over what your pumping energy is. This actually shows the hours of operation for the, uh, for the coils. The blue uh, data is actual operation when the delta T limiting function is active. And you can see it varies depending on what, uh, what air handling unit you're actually talking about. Number six had a 75% delta T limiter. Number four only had a 10% delta T limiting characteristic. Uh, interestingly, at the beginning of the chill water season, that coil was blown out. It was replaced with a brand new heat craft 14 degree coil. Even controlling to 12 degrees, that 14 degree coil, brand new, was still going to be overflowing to a 10% a, to a of the operating time period. Okay, and then uh, for seasonal comparison, uh, in 2010, from, uh, for the month of August and September, the delta T for the whole building, and, and MIT has independent flow and delta T measurements for the whole building. So this is not our data, this is MIT data. It had a 6.15 degree delta T. This past cooling season, it had a 12.14 degree delta T. Essentially, we've brought the load delta T up to what the chill water plant is actually looking for. All right, uh, it's especially effective at reducing uh, overflow on power coils that display uh, power saturation. Overall reduction in chill water flow, typically you can have at least a 25% reduction in flow with an in excess of 50% re uh, savings on pumping energy. Uh, you're maximizing coil performance, you're saving. You can actually document the commissioning of the coil from one season to the next with that 13-month uh, uh, data archive. And that's it.